Welcome back to ECE 320A. Homework assignment number six is due on Sunday. And you actually will have some more material versus just the classroom for convolution or unit seven. So you'll want to look at those notes and videos. We have, or I'm supplementing what we're going to be able to do in class with a few more pieces of material. It's essentially how do you do the mechanics of convolution. So it's very fun. You get to flip and slide and you get to talk about uh, limits, all sorts of fun things. And then there's two example videos. They're shorter segments than 75 minutes and if you play them at one and a half speed or two speed it goes quicker. <clears throat> That's our announcements. Today what I want to do is finish up our coverage of incorporating initial conditions into the S domain circuits. <clears throat> Essentially how do we either do that with series voltage sources or with parallel current sources and why might we want to do that. Then we will get into transfer functions as a topic and we're doing that because these transfer functions are very versatile. We can solve any kind of system problem that we want by taking that transfer function and multiplying it in the frequency domain with the Laplace transform of an input waveform and then inverse Laplace transforming to find the output response. We can take that transfer function and use that to obtain an impulse response of our system. And the impulse response is simply how does our system behave when you kick it? Or when you hit it with an impulse, how does your system behave? That's what the little h of t is. And then we will show that we can use that impulse response in the convolution integral to find the output for any generic input waveform. So that impulse response is very useful and valuable. We will also use the transfer function when we want to learn or quickly determine sinusoidal steady state response. And then we are simply replacing S everywhere with J omega where omega is the frequency that we're exciting our system with. And that tells us how that system shapes that sinusoidal signal. How does it amplify or attenuate? How does it change the magnitude? And how does it delay or advance? How does it shift that signal as a function of time? What's its magnitude and phase? And that we can get directly from the transfer function. And we can do it with your calculator. You can do it algebraically. You can do it graphically. So if you have your drafting tools, you now have the ability to measure angles and measure lengths with your dividers and do all of that calculation graphically if you want. And probably we won't get to it today, but next time after you have looked at the convolution material on D2L, we will start to develop a, sort of an intuitive explanation of that convolution integral. That's the idea. We will probably get to that next time. Let's start today by, you're never going to forget Eli and Ice, right? And you know what that provides you. If you have Eli and Ice, that's going to allow you to immediately write down the time domain expression relationship between current and voltage for the inductor and the capacitor. Let's look at the inductor first for how do we now, if we see an inductor in our circuit, can we immediately sketch an S domain equivalent circuit with an inductor and the appropriate initial condition source term or a source term that is there because of the initial conditions. Here is our schematic that we are playing with. 
for that assignment of the direction of the current going from left to right and our polarity being labeled as a drop from left to right, that now tells us that this is consistent with Eli. V is equal to L, VI sub L, DT. <clears throat> and if we want, which we do today, and probably you will want to do for this chapter, chapter 13, we want to now take that into the frequency domain, and we do that by Laplace transforming that differential equation to immediately end up with the Laplace transform of the inductor's voltage is equal to L times S. The Laplace transform of the current through that inductor minus I sub L of zero minus. And if we distribute that inductance across both terms, We now have this relationship between our voltage in the frequency domain and impedance associated with the inductor, which is SL, and a term due to the initial condition on that inductor. And we can now take this relationship in one of two ways. If you're doing mesh analysis, you probably want to take it such that you now have a series voltage source if you're trying to do mesh analysis. It's more convenient to incorporate now your initial condition as a series connected voltage source. Which if we now sketch our circuit Our current is now I sub L of S. Here is our impedance SL. And now we have the polarity on our source, which has a magnitude of I L sub I of 0 minus. And that's supposed to be giving us that total inductor voltage capital V sub L of S. And we can verify that, in fact, that does, that is consistent with this expression that we just derived by, dip, by Laplace transforming the derivative relationship from Eli by simply saying, oh, let's go this way in terms of a KVL. And that now allows us to say we have SL times I sub L minus L I sub L of 0 minus minus V sub L equal to 0. And we can take that minus V sub L by adding that V sub L to both sides. And we end up with a consistent circuit representation relative to the equation that we obtained from Laplace transforming the differential relationship. Are there questions on how to draw that? Now, anytime you have a circuit, and maybe you've labeled it in this fashion in the time domain, you can sketch the S domain equivalent as we've done here. Now, if you were doing node voltage analysis in your circuit problem, then you might want to not put a voltage source in series, but you might want to put a current source in parallel. And we can do that by taking this equation and solving for I sub L of S. If we take that and divide both sides by S, or all terms by SL, and isolate I sub L, we then have 1 over SL times V sub L of S plus I sub L of 0 minus over S. That's exactly the same equation that we had before by Laplace transforming the differential relationship of our inductor, just by isolating I sub L. <clears throat> 
Now what we want to do is we want to sketch a circuit that has an impedance and it has a current source that will accommodate that initial condition. Meaning now let's say that this is our inductor current, total inductor current. Part of that is coming from the impedance. Now we have this entire piece here is our V sub L of S where this current here is that piece. Let me just call that I1. And if we consider that node, then you can see, I hope, that we need this current that's going to accommodate our initial condition to have a direction given by going from left to right in that source and with an amplitude or a value of I sub L of zero minus over S. And that's all because, or you can, I hope, convince yourself of that by applying KCL at that left node. We have I sub L coming in and two currents going out. And those two currents going out, one piece is due to the impedance, the other piece is due to the initial condition, which is now our current source in parallel with that impedance. And you can now put this into your circuit in the appropriate way if you're writing node volt or Kirchhoff current laws or node voltage analysis when you're doing your circuit design. Questions on how to handle inductors? Once you have done that analysis, you can then find everything in the time domain that you need by inverse Laplace transforming. That's why we spent all that time in Chapter 12. We're going to jump immediately into the S domain, solve what it forever for whatever we want in the S domain and then inverse Laplace transform to obtain the time domain expression. Let's look at the same development for the capacitor. And it will lead to slightly different results, but here is our capacitor voltage and our capacitor current. And if we're going to do the same development, then we need to give ICE the same level of credit that we gave Eli. So there's our ICE that reminds us then that in the time domain, we have I sub C of T is equal to C dV sub C dT. Again, we can go into the frequency domain by Laplace transforming that differential relationship, and we now have a scaling factor of our capacitor value, and now we Laplace transform that derivative. And if we want to know or create an expression for the current, we now have SC times V sub C of S minus C V sub C of zero minus. Or if we want to view that as an impedance, we may want to put it underneath V sub C so that it looks like V over Z to get a, give us a current. We can say, well, that's equivalent to 1 over SC minus C V sub C of 0 minus. And that's our I sub C of S. There now we've isolated a very explicitly what the impedance is of our, in, of our capacitor. That's 1 over SC in contrast to the impedance of the inductor. <coughs> 
this expression is now begging us to look at what happens or putting this into a parallel S domain circuit. Whoops. Where we now have the current again made up of two parts. Here is our voltage across that capacitor. We have the total capacitor current, I sub C, again made up of two pieces. One piece due to the impedance of the capacitor and the other piece due to the initial condition and now which direction does that source need to be oriented? Does the arrowhead need to be on the left or the right to be consistent with this expression? Now it needs to be going opposite to let's say this current, let's say we're again calling this I1. I1 goes from, from left to right, but the other one is going in the opposite direction. It's now going back and it has a value of C, V sub C of zero minus. Are we comfortable with that connection? Connecting the equation with that circuit, you need to make sure that you get your sources oriented in the proper direction before you start doing your analysis. And this is consistent with that time domain circuit model of I sub C and V sub C. Now you would replace that with this particular diagram if you were trying to do what kind of analysis? In VA, node voltage analysis. That's what you would be using. You would be using these parallel sources. Now if we wanted to go the other way, and you probably are all preferring to do mesh analysis, then we need to change it up just a little bit and introduce not a current source but a voltage source in series with that impedance. If we go back to our governing equation, let's say the middle blue line, we can solve for our voltage V sub C of S and put that other term on the other side and we now have for this series circuit we could write down our current voltage relationship as 1 over SC, there's our impedance, times I sub C of S. We are now putting that initial condition term on the other side. We can add that to both sides to give us then plus V sub C of 0 minus and we divided both sides by SC. The C's cancel and we're left with an S downstairs. In this circuit, we now have our current, I sub C of S. We have our total voltage that is made up of two pieces, an initial condition piece and an impedance piece. And now which way do we write the polarity? inside this voltage source that has a value of V sub C of 0 minus over S. So now if we read from left to right, this would be plus and minus and you can convince yourself of that again if you simply wrote a KVL equation around that circuit now you have 1 over SC times I sub C marching to the left plus V sub C of 0 minus over S 
minus v sub c of s all equaling zero and we can take that v sub c of s over to the other side and we have our governing relationship. Not only do you have to worry about the polarity and the direction of these initial conditions, but do you see that they're not the same structurally as far as the expression for those initial conditions? C V sub C of 0 minus, it does contain the initial condition, but that's different than V sub C of 0 minus over S. And it depends on which of these parallel or series circuit structures you are including into your circuit based on your preference for doing the analysis. One is not right and one is wrong. They're both correct. It's just based on what you want to do when you're analyzing your circuit. Which circuit model is used? And this is what you will like, maybe. Depends on personal preference. And maybe the particular situation or circuit that you're de dealing with. Let's say that you now say, oh, I'm going to do mesh analysis. Then what kind of structure are you going to be looking to introduce from the time domain into your S domain equivalent? That's going to be your series for both inductor and capacitor. If you were doing node analysis, then you're doing your parallel current sources. Is it clear how you now can immediately go from a time domain circuit into an S domain, do all of your circuit analysis in the S domain, and when you need an answer, you do chapter 12, you inverse Laplace transform. Let's now go into a discussion of the transfer function. And it just disappeared. Here's our definition. Typically, we will use capital H of S for this transfer function expression. It's going to be a ratio of polynomials in S. The numerator will start out maybe as a ratio. So this may actually end up with a ratio of ratios. But you'll simplify all of that to just get a rational expression for capital H of S. The top is the output time responses Laplace transform. And the bottom is the input time response Laplace transform. where that capital H of S is our transfer function. What capital H of S represents? Depends on the input. and the output. Where now with this concept of a transfer function, we can represent a lot of different systems 
by this very basic block diagram. Here is our system, H of S, and that might be a car suspension. It might be a home's ventilation system. It might be a filter. It might be a circuit. Here is our capital X of S. That's our input, and our output is capital Y of S. And you could have one system, let's say that it's a circuit, you could identify a lot of different transfer functions just for that one circuit. That one circuit or system can have several transfer function transfer functions associated with it. And some example input and output functions. could be, let's say that this left column will be our input side, and we'll say in the time domain that's x of t, and the right side is our output side. In the time domain, that might be y of t. For inputs, we might have current. We might have voltage. We might have force. We might have velocity. We might have angle, we might have position. All of those are potential inputs. For outputs, we could have similar variables. We could have a current as our output, we could have a voltage as an output, we might have a force, we might have an acceleration. velocity, angle, position, and now you could actually, you don't have to read straight across. You might have for an input a current and maybe the output is acceleration. You might have a force and that might then be associated with some voltage as your output. Or maybe it's a velocity and you now have a current that that's corresponding to. You can have all sorts of different combinations of inputs and outputs to produce a transfer function. In this class, we will probably focus on these top two rows. We'll have currents or voltages as our inputs and currents and voltages are as our outputs, but this concept generalizes to many different domains or many different problems. Let's now look at an example. And since this is a circuits class, let's look at a environmental problem. No, I'm teasing. Let's look at a circuit. Be real creative, huh? You're supposed to be becoming experts at circuit design, so let's continue with that. We have an RLC circuit, a voltage source, and now maybe we want to identify a current, which is common to all of those elements in that circuit, or we might be interested in the voltage dropped across any of those elements. Let's just consider the capacitor's voltage drop in this example. Now, I want to, I'm now interested in transfer functions, which means that I'm looking for ratios of polynomials of S, which is sort of begging 
me to say, I need to redraw that in the S domain. I need to do my analysis in the frequency domain. If I do that, what does the S domain circuit look like? Structurally, does it look a lot different how it's interconnected? And what we will conclude with after we go through this is when we're doing transfer functions, we're assuming zero initial conditions. So now we don't have to worry about those sources. We can simply say, oh, I have a resistor, I have an inductor, and I have a capacitor. This was now capital V sub G of S. My resistor's impedance is just R. What's the impedance of my inductor? That's just SL. And what's the impedance of my capacitor? And this might be my one of my choices for an output, and this might be another choice for an output. That's now my S domain equivalent circuit. Now let's say that I'm interested in a transfer function between the source voltage and the current through that circuit. Can you find an equation that relates the current and the voltage source? If all of your circuit elements were resistors, do you feel really comfortable with solving that problem? You have exactly the same problem now. It's just those R's have been generalized to have the functions of S. Meaning we can, by in trivial inspection, we can write an equation for I. That's just our voltage source divided by the sum of the impedances which was R plus SL plus 1 over SC. And if we want a transfer function now between that source V sub G and the current I, let me call that H sub 1, what do I put on top and what do I put on bottom? I want the transfer function between the voltage source and the current. What's my input? The voltage source, and where does, where does that go as an expression? That's in the denominator. So I now have this V sub G of S down here. The output is upstairs, and now let me put in the appropriate relationships. This is now V sub G of S over R plus SL plus 1 over SC. And downstairs, I just have V sub G of S. These transfer functions, if you end up with a source buried in there, you've done something wrong. This V sub G cancels, and now we just have a description on the right-hand side that's some ratio of polynomials in S. H sub 1 of S is now 1 over R plus SL plus 1 over SC. That's not quite as clean maybe as we want it to be. Why don't we get a common denominator in the denominator, and then that denominator in the denominator jumps upstairs by multiplying by 1 so that we now have SC over S squared LC plus SRC plus 1. And that's now one transfer function associated with that circuit. Or you could get that same thing by multiplying both top and bottom by SC or multiplying the whole thing by 1. And then you get the SC upstairs, and the SC starts canceling the one term on the far right, and it just introduces an SC into those left two terms in the denominator. What's the order of that system's transfer function? It's a second order, and is that consistent with what you would have expected from that circuit? 
had two energy storage devices, you have a second order transfer function, okay, good, I'm consistent, at least. Depending on what your values for R, L, and C are will influence, where is your zero located? Do you have any finite zeros in this transfer function? It's right at the origin, isn't it? It's at zero. And your poles, where do you think they live? In the left half plane, why do you think that? Because you had a passive circuit and you had resistors in there and the resistors are extracting energy from your circuit. It shouldn't be unstable. You better have poles in the left half plane. If you had just L's and C's, then you would have poles on the imaginary axis. Now that you have resistors in there, that slides you over into the left half plane. If you plug those numbers into the quadratic formula, you better get negative real parts for your roots, is what we're saying. You better end up with S values in the left half plane. Let's look at a second transfer function for that circuit. Suppose now we want the transfer function between the source voltage, V sub G, and the capacitor's voltage, V V sub C. Now we want V sub C of S, the output, over V sub G of S. But there's no need to sort of reinvent the wheel because we already know or have an expression for I. And if we have an expression for I, the voltage across that capacitor is not very difficult to find. That's just times the impedance of that capacitor, which is 1 over SC. Meaning we can now say, oh, I can find V sub C of S. That's just 1 over SC times I of S. And I of S was V sub G of S over R plus SL plus 1 over SC. Let me distribute that SC into the denominator expression, and that will cancel the SC in the bottom of one of those pieces. And I now end up with V sub G of S over S squared LC plus SRC plus 1. And if I now use that in my expression for H sub 2, I think it's clear that the V sub G's cancel and I end up with 1 over S squared LC plus SRC plus 1. And if you look at this transfer function, is it the same as our previous transfer function? <laughs> Not quite. But what can we notice in terms of something similar? I'm assuming that in your differential equations class, you've heard of a characteristic polynomial. Or did you think you could forget that? That's equal to the denominator polynomial in these transfer functions. The denominator was the same. Since we didn't change the circuit, we just changed the output of that circuit. So this characteristic polynomial, which is the denominator polynomial, is the same. In H sub 1 of S and H sub 2 of S. Where was our 0 in H sub 2 of S? <laughs> 
So what did we have a finite zero in h sub 2 of s? No. So it can get confusing if you say you have zero zeros, but you have no zeros, no finite zeros in h sub 2 of s. Let's write down some properties that we can now associate with these transfer function objects. One is that we have linear, or if we have linear lumped parameter circuits, those linear lumped parameter circuits yield rational transfer functions. Now, what in the world, where did the oatmeal come from? What have you heard of lumped parameter other than lumped in oatmeal? Did everyone have their oatmeal this morning? Did you still full from your oatmeal breakfast? It sticks with you, doesn't it? A little bit more than some things for breakfast. <coughs> your energy drink? Maybe, maybe not. Lumped parameter. What does that mean? So now a lumped parameter is what you might have in 351C or in 220 or in this class. You have physical or discrete components of resistors, inductors, and capacitors versus a transmission line where the resistance is actually distributed across the entire line. You can't, mo or you don't typically model that entire transmission line that might be kil kilometers long with one resistor value. You distribute that resistance across the entire line. It, you're not lumping it into a single resistor. And it all depends on the frequencies that you're interested in and the wavelength of that, those signals that you're applying to the circuit. If your wavelength is about the same or comparable in size to the dimension of your circuit, then you have to worry about distributed parameter circuits or non-lumped parameters. Here we have, for lumped parameters, we have discrete components, which is what we have in this class. Or, you could say these discrete components are not the same as distributed components. Here you're thinking transmission lines, and here you're thinking discrete circuit elements. R, L, and C. So we have these traditional linear lumped parameter circuits. We're not pushing these to the extreme where your resistors or your inductors or capacitors have nonlinear relationships. We're only worrying about their linear behavior that's producing these transfer functions with rational expressions. That just means you have S polynomials upstairs and S polynomials downstairs. You have a ratio of polynomials in S. That's the rational transfer functions. Here's what you probably like is that when you're computing or finding transfer functions, you don't have to worry about initial conditions because we're just trying to find the system behavior, not worrying about the initial conditions. So these transfer functions are obtained or found 
under zero initial conditions. The poles of our transfer function, and you know what those, or how to find those, correct? Those are just the values of s that cause your denominator to vanish. The poles of h of s govern the natural response, or transient response, of the system. The natural response is if you excite your system or kick it, it will just start to shake. And it shakes based on the poles of your transfer function. If I gave you a transfer function, or maybe I said, oh, this transfer function has poles at minus 1, and minus 6. Can you tell me the general structure of the natural response? Or if you now kick this system, how is it going to shake or move? What will be the modes, what will be the behaviors of this output y of t. Or if you energized all of your energy storage elements and then said, OK, go, how is it going to respond? Pardon? It will decay, but you can tell me exactly the shape of these modes. OK, it's 1 over s plus 1 in the frequency domain, and it's 1 over s plus 6 in the frequency domain. Some sum of those in the time domain, now what is it? e to the minus t and e to the minus 6t. Some linear combination of that. You don't have to find these coefficients, but if somebody said, what's the natural response? Here are my poles. You know that it's going to move at e to the minus t and e to the minus 6t. When will you have to be focused on watching that response? When will it be done? If you close your eyes, how long will you have to have your eyes closed before you'll miss everything? What is infinity in this system? My question clear? I'm getting a lot of five, five runs, five seconds. So the e to the minus 6t term is much faster than the e to the minus t term. The e to the minus t term is the dominant term or the dominant pole. So you base your analysis on that slow pole. It has a time constant it's easy to find. It's just one, and you take five of those, and you're essentially done. You have five seconds to wait. So infinite is more than five seconds in this particular example. Another property of transfer functions, which we've already really talked about, is that the denominator polynomial can be called or equals what other polynomial? That equals the characteristic polynomial. A stable system has all it all of let's say its poles. <clears throat> 
where do all of its poles live in the complex plane? In the left half plane, because what's special about the left half plane? It'll decay, and why is it decaying? It has negative real parts, doesn't it? Those negative real parts give us the e to the minus 2t, e to the minus 6t. A stable system has all of its poles in the left half plane or LHP if you're tweeting. And somebody, I think, said something about that on their exam. They said if we're tweeting, then they put some acronym there. I said, good, let me tweet that out right now, or text that. What do we know about passive RLC networks relative to stability and transfer functions? If I give you a passive RLC circuit, maybe 100 R's, 50 L's, and 60 C's, what can you at least tell me about that transfer function? It's going to have all of its poles in the left half plane. It's going to be a stable transfer function. We've talked about poles. We have to give equal billing to the zeros. The zeros of H of S are the roots of the numerator polynomial of H of S. If the finite zeros of a stable H of S are in the left half plane. So the stable H of S says our poles are in the left half plane. Now we're saying the finite zeros are in the left half plane. We actually give that system a special name. The system is called minimum phase. Let's see if we can come up with a way to categorize or have a feel for what we mean by a minimum phase system. Suppose that I have a system that has poles here. And maybe I have a zero right there. Is that system stable? Is it minimum phase? That's a min minimum phase system. And what do I mean by minimum phase? We are going to learn that here, well, you already know that this is the real axis, the horizontal axis, and this is the imaginary axis. And if we want to know how does this system behave as a function of frequency, or how does this system respond to sinusoidal signals, we can start looking at the magnitude and phase of this system as we walk up 
the imaginary axis. Meaning, now we need to put on our imagination glasses. <clears throat> now that we have those on, on this S plane, where we have X's, imagine infinitely tall poles. Since we're calling them poles, let's just stick an infinitely tall pole on top of those X's. Where you have zeros, think of those as being thumbtacks. And what we're doing is let's put a rubber sheet over the entire S plane. And now we've propped it up where those poles are, and we've tacked it down where those zeros are located. Now, what are you looking at? Now you have this contour shape above the S plane. Yes? The magnitude of your frequency response of this transfer function or the transfer function associated with this system, you can find by walking underneath that big top tent along the imaginary axis. How high that tent is or that rubber sheet is above you tells you how that transfer function is going to modify the amplitude of your signal, your sinusoid, as it passes through that transfer function. If you were to excite this system with a constant input, then the transfer function you could evaluate at the origin. You would evaluate it at J0. And you would say, oh, the zero is going to contribute that much in the numerator expression, that distance, that length. This pole will contribute this much, and this pole will contribute that much. And if you had a magnitude in your transfer function, you would have to incorporate that. Now, if we increase the frequency, we're just walking up this imaginary axis. Suppose we walk up to j omega sub x. Now, not only can we find the magnitude of each of these pieces. Wow, this is. I'm just going to stare, and that's pretty. It's amazing what you can gain pleasure from on a circuit diagram, huh? Or an S point. Now, here is the angle associated with that pole, or with that zero. We have this frequency of omega sub x, and we now measure our angles relative to this horizontal line, real axis going off to the right. Can you see that the angle associated with the top pole is some negative angle, maybe minus 15 degrees? The bottom complex pole has an angle of maybe 60 degrees. The zero itself has an angle what? If I was at J1, it would be 45 degrees. I'm a little under that, so it's a little bit less than 45 degrees. Does everyone see that? <clears throat> now, all of this was supposed to motivate this minimum phase concept. Suppose that I now placed a zero. Instead of that red zero, suppose my transfer function had a zero there. How far away is that zero from the imaginary axis at j omega sub x relative to the distance from the red zero? Same distance, isn't it? So the magnitude expression is going to look the same. But what's the angle of that zero over here at plus one versus the zero at minus one? Again, we're measuring the angle relative to this horizontal real axis. Do you see that theta sub n is much bigger than theta? Theta is the minimum phase 
angle for that magnitude characteristic that you have for that transfer function. If you had a zero in the right half plane to produce exactly the same magnitude characteristic, it would not give you the same phase behavior. It would be a non-minimum phase behavior. And that's why these bicycles are partly difficult to maneuver. Not only are they unstable, but they have a right half plane zero. So they behave differently than systems that have minimum phase behavior or zeros in the left half plane. How would we find some of that information? Suppose that I now want to write down the transfer function of my first system that I had identified with the red zero. I would have now an S plus one. And what would my denominator look like? And you see that you could write that down by inspection to be that. And unless somebody told you otherwise, you would maybe have to assume some amplitude A1. But that's now the pole zero structure of the transfer function associated with the minimum phase system that has a zero at minus one. What would the transfer function of the other system look like with the non-minimum phase? So this is the minimum phase. Now we have an A sub 1. Is H sub 2 stable or unstable? Stable. The poles are exactly where they were before, and the first one was stable. It's just now we have a zero in the right half plane. If we wanted to graphically find the frequency response of this transfer function, we could find that by walking under the big top tent or going from the origin up the imaginary axis and measuring how tall that rubber sheet is above us. That's the magnitude response of our system. Or if you have a stereo, that's your graphic equalizer. Right? You adjust that for, if you wanted more base, you can slide that slider up at low frequencies. If you wanted to attenuate the base, you would lower that. And that's now what we're going to be interested in for these transfer functions. How do we shape the magnitude response to give us the frequency response behavior that we want? And if we said apply a signal, let's say, of frequency 2 radians per second, we could now graphically determine that magnitude response and the phase shift that that system produces by looking at these lengths or distances to 2 on the imaginary axis and the angles of those particular coordinates. So that the frequency response of this system is obtained from the transfer function, except now we restrict our S values to be right along the imaginary axis. And now maybe it's easier to think about these poles. Let's say that this is now S plus 2 minus J1. This is S plus 2 plus J1. 
this is s plus 1, and this is a1. But now we need to evaluate that at s equal j omega. Meaning the frequency response of this system is now a1 j omega plus 1 j omega plus 2 minus j1, j omega plus 2 plus j1. And we want to write that as a complex number. It already is a complex number. You plug in a particular omega, omega equal to 2, and you now have a complex number. And that's how this system would respond to an excitation of 2 radians per second. If it was 4 radians per second, then you would plug in omega equal to 4. But what do we also know? If this is a complex number, we can think of this as a magnitude and an angle. What's the magnitude of that numerator expression? Well, that's just 1 plus j omega magnitude. Yeah, that's the correct answer. You could say that, right? But that's just the square root of 1 squared plus omega squared. What's the angle of that? That's in rectangular form in the top expression. In polar form, it's the magnitude at an angle. What's the angle of that complex number? Imaginary part over real part, omega over 1. And we can do that for each of the terms in the denominator. We can now say, oh, the magnitude is just 2 squared, or let me just write it as I've done it before. It's 2 plus j omega minus 1. What's its angle? And then we have the other pole, the magnitude of 2 plus j omega plus 1 at an angle of the inverse tangent omega plus 1 over 2. Suppose that we said we want omega equal to 2. The top one is now 1 plus j2. We need to find the magnitude of that. But that's just the square root of 1 squared plus omega, or 2 squared. If we go back to our diagram, if omega is equal to 2, then we, go, we walk over 1 and up 2, and we find the hypotenuse of that right triangle. And that's the magnitude. That's the distance. If we had our dividers, we could put those dividers down and tell you exactly what that length is. That's the square root of 5. What's the angle? That's now the inverse tangent of we went 2 up and 1 over the inverse tangent of 2 over 1, and that's what we had in this expression right here. The magnitude was right there. What about this magnitude? Where is it? If we follow this, these instructions, we would say, oh, we need to go over 2. Then in the imaginary direction, we go down 1 and up omega, and we end up at that red dot, which is really just 2 and 2 minus 1, which is 1. And the, right, the hypotenuse of that right triangle we could measure. What's the angle 
you measure it from this horizontal line and it's the angle that has a vertical change of one and a horizontal distance of two. Which if you plugged in omega of two, you have an inverse tangent of one over two. And the bottom one, now we go over two, we go up one, and we go up omega. And we end up again at the red dot, but that's now the hypotenuse associated with a right triangle that has a horizontal length of one and a vertical distance of three, square root of ten. Is this making any sense? Now I'm saying omega is 2, where that red dot is, just to give us something to tie down. But we could run that omega. Now on the weekend, you could say, oh, for grins, let me try omega from 0 to 1,000. Okay? And start plugging that into your calculator. Or you can what? Do one command in MATLAB, say Bodhi, and it will give you the frequency response of that transfer function. But you need to know, it, did I put that data into MATLAB correctly? And now you can intuitively start to reason your way through that question. You can say, let me check it at omega equal to 10 radians per second. Does that number that I'm seeing in MATLAB look consistent with what I'm seeing on my envelope that I've sketched this transfer function on as far as its pole zero diagram. Meaning, what, does, what is this going to do as a function of frequency? If you looked at this system, this transfer function, and you said, oh, what's its behavior at, or somebody might say, okay, here's a transfer function. Can you tell me, is it low pass in nature? Is it high pass in behavior? Is it band reject? Is it band pass? You have maybe four options. What would you say this system would give you in terms of a characteristic? Is it low pass, high pass, band pass, or band reject? What's it going to do to DC signals? Can you answer that question? What are you asking now if I said, what's this system going to do to constant signals? Does that say anything about S? If I say I have a DC signal, how is that signal shaking? Is it shaking if it's DC? No. S is 0. So you plug in S equal to 0, and what do you get? A valid number, right? A1 divided by 5. There's your DC gain of that system. You put in 3, and 3 is going to be scaled by A1 over 5. What's going to happen at really high frequencies? Now you walk way up on that tent, way up the imaginary axis, and what happens to the lengths from those poles? To this point, how far away are those poles? Pretty far. And how, many, and how far away is that zero? Pretty far. But how many poles do you have relative to zeros? You have two poles, one zero. So you have two really fars divided into one really far. What's going to happen to that number? Do you see that it's getting small? It's going to die at high frequencies. So you had something that was a value at DC, and now it's rolling off at high frequencies. It prefers low pass or low frequencies. It's a low pass filter. 
and characteristic. We'll pick up with those ideas and convolution on Tuesday.